Welcome to the Creating an Empowered Body, Mind and Life podcast with your host, author, fitness entrepreneur, empowerment and transformation coach, Chris Ellerby Hemmings. This podcast is about helping people find happiness through health, fitness and mindset. So here we have another awesome empowered body mind and life podcast and today we've got Jordan Syatt all the way over from America. So I'll just introduce Jordan myself and then I'll ask him to kind of introduce himself a little bit a little bit more so you guys get to see or hear a little bit about him. He is a five times world record powerlifter. He's one of the few in the world to lift four times his own body weight. I'm going to ask him what that was and what that was in a minute. He's a world-renowned coach. He's featured in CN, uh, CNN, the Huffington Post, men's fitness, and he has a very similar philosophy to mine, hence the reason why I'm asking him to jump on this podcast with me. Um, his strap line on his website, or a little bit on his website, was to gain, for the, for the people who follow Jordan, is to gain knowledge of how to manage their own training and nutrition without sacrificing any important things in life, like friends, family, and beer. He is <laughs> he is also a uh, sorry he is also a coach to somebody I've, somebody I've followed for a long time and respect gratefully and that's Gary Vaynerchuk. He uh, obviously I'd love to in the future to grow enough to maybe get Gary on this podcast, but we'll see over the next few years how that goes. Um, and I also just want to take this time to say thank you very much for jumping on board and taking the time to do this because as most people know in fitness we do these podcasts a little bit for fun and obviously free of charge and to give you guys a little bit more context into who we are without the uh, audacity to be able to plan a video. He also, if given one wish, he'd like to be a wizard. So, without further ado, let's get to it. And if you'd like to introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners and give them the opportunity to understand a bit more about you, that would be awesome. Yeah, well, dude, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, honestly, like, I think you bas- like you you got all that from my <laughs> website. So I think uh, <laughs> think you you introduced me really well. Honestly, like that's pretty much it. That's I mean, if you have any specific questions, more than happy to answer. But basically, just a strength coach, nutrition coach, uh, n- nerdy meathead. Like I love lifting weights and I love learning why, like, and how, and all like the nuts and bolts of it. Um, but otherwise, man, that's pretty much it. And uh, and I'm happy to be here. Okay. Well, it's obviously this, this podcast is about trying to find um, happiness from fitness, well, from a lift fitness lifestyle. So the first question, obviously, I'll put to you is what I've seen from your videos and a lot of the followers of me and, and my businesses have shared your content, and I've, that's where I came onto it, was this balanced, happy guy approach, um, but at the same time as being realistic. So how do you feel fitness has helped you stay happy was a question i'd like to ask you how has fitness helped me stay that's a man that's a that's a really good question no one's ever asked me that before Mm. um fitness i mean honestly like i think here's what i think happens a lot of people in the fitness industry they get into the fitness industry because they started working out largely because they were insecure um, they, they wanted to change something about their body. Maybe they wanted to lose fat. Maybe they wanted to build muscle. Uh, most people started working out and eating well, maybe because they weren't happy with something. Mm. Um, and then they became a lot, especially the personal trainers, they became obsessed with it. Um, most personal trainers had some obsessive period uh a lot of them end up doing figure competitions and then what will happen is they'll do the figure shows and then after like when they're done with that they'll talk about how awful their experience was with it and how they became too obsessed with it like you see this pattern over and over and over again like where people are like yeah so i got into it and then i had figure competitions then after the figure competitions i was like i had an eating disorder and blah 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 yeah and then like that happens all the time and then like um whether or not that actually that happens with everyone, most people go through an obsessive period. Maybe they go to powerlifting and they're obsessed with powerlifting or whatever. So did, like, you, so did you do that yourself? I went to powerlifting, um, but that was long after I really got involved in the fitness industry. And that was already I, when I had already developed a, more of a healthier and happier relationship with it. Yeah. For me, the, the way that fitness essentially like it, it kept me happy was – um, I, I've been through different phases. Like at first I did it because like I was doing it for wrestling. I wrestled my whole life and I did it because I wanted to 
be strong and healthy for wrestling. And then I did it more because of uh, a little bit more like vanity for a little bit. It wasn't vanity for too long, honestly. Like I, I, everyone wants to look good naked. I think anyone who says otherwise is a liar. But like uh, it was mostly between like performance and then also because I was like I want to be a personal trainer. So then like I like wanted to learn everything I could about it. And then it was powerlifting. And, and more recently, it switched to just more for health and for keeping me sane while I'm building my business. Um, I don't really have much performance-based goals right now, like in terms of I'm not looking to deadlift 4.5 times my body weight. I'm not looking to <laughs> like be – you know, I'm, I'm like – I, I've had goals and I've reached those goals, and now my main goal is my my business and helping other people reach their fitness goals. Yeah. So for me, at fitness at this point is mostly stay healthy, stay happy, use it to complement my life instead of letting it rule my life, and I can sort of help other people do the same. Yeah, exactly the same message as um, as I've got. You see, um, which is definitely what well, I've watched. More, I've watched quite a lot of your videos, and you've got a very similar message, um, which is interesting because. I think it takes time to develop that and I feel like what you're trying to do is, is reduce that time for people, the same thing, as, same thing as what I'm trying to do. I personally jumped into fitness myself just for the six pack on the beach when I was like 20 and you know tried every single diet, every single method I possibly could to get that six pack and I could only hold it for a short time before my eating disorder would come out which ended up being binge eating and I would gain weight again and that went on for absolutely ages um so yeah it's interesting but do you feel like the we had another guy on last week when we were talking about progression around lifting um and fitness so progression equals happiness in the good words of um, tony robbins does that kind of suit you as well do you think progression equals happiness progression equals happiness mm. um no i don't actually interesting, um, interesting. I think I think progression equals motivation. Okay. I think motivation is is developed through progression, right? So like okay. that's like people people will lose motivation when they don't see progress, right? So it's it's one of the reasons why I'm actually a big proponent for certain people of using rapid fat loss protocols very briefly because I know for a fact that if I take on a client and they don't lose fat quickly, they are more likely to quit and then go to one of those quick fix schemes yep. that like don't work and they're going to waste their money. So I'll, I'll have an outright conversation. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to do a quick rapid fat loss protocol. You lose X amount of weight. Once you lose X amount of weight, we're going to stop and we're going to do more of a maintenance approach. My point being to help drive your motivation yeah, yeah, so yeah. that then then we can then progress to more of a sustainable, maintainable uh, route. And like th I think motivate, I think progress drives motivation, but progress doesn't drive happiness because I think a lot of people do things and make progress in things even if it's not what they're happy with. Like people sit in a job they hate and they might climb the ladder and essentially making progress, but they don't, they don't like it. They, it's like they're doing it because they think they should or because they're not sure what else to do. Mm, but like, I, I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, and that like, that like when they make that progress, it drives their motivation to keep in that job, even if it's not their, what they think they should be doing. Um, I think happiness is something entirely separate. Mm, that's really interesting. A uh, different way of looking at it. Also, um, I kind of correlate in my own life happiness and product pro happiness productivity and motivation together so they kind of come at, at the same time is almost what you're saying there so if you're motivated you tend to be happy and productive at the same time do you reckon um if you're motivated i just want to reiterate to make sure i, I understand if you're motivated you tend to be happy and productive at the same time hmm. um yes i think if you're motivated you tend to be happy and productive but i also think motivation is fickle I think that motivation will not last in terms of like uh, I don't think that like for example when someone starts a new train I'm gonna I'm gonna use fitness I can also use business if you prefer but like when when you use when someone starts a new training program a new nutrition program they're excited they're motivated they're ready to go but once that 
initial excitement and motivation dwindles, mm. what then, what do they have to rely on? And I think too many people try to rely on motivation, which is why they end up failing because like, it's not the motivation that's going to be driving you. It's going to be the habits. It's going to be like what you've built up to sustain you over the long term. Yeah, habits, and like habit it, and ritual settings, right? That's it. That's it. So I say use motivation to build your habits. Rely on your habits to carry you for the long term. Mm, it's something we go deep into in um, Empowered by Eating actually is, is why you're doing what you're doing rather than looking at the individual day or just a weight loss. We try to make it over the 10 to 20 year thinking which enables you to then actually build them habits rather than just looking for the short-term fix but it's hard to get that across to many people in the industry because it's so saturated with the quick fix like you just like you just mentioned yeah man and that's why also the the flexibility and the the diet approach comes in as well to not use willpower as much as possible especially when it comes to diet what do you think about what do you think about that Say that one more time. I just want to make sure I heard it right. The flexibility approach to dieting, so you're a bit more relaxed in your approach and a bit more balanced. It's like that's going to have a less of an impact on your willpower than it would, or your, your motivation, so to speak, if we're using willpower and motivation in the same in the same context. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think the idea of flexible dieting is the best one, and I use it with myself and all of my clients. I, mm. I'm not gonna. I, I also think the fitness industry runs on a pendulum and it's either something is the best thing in the world or the worst thing in the world. Like <laughs> definitely yeah. car- carbs are good or carbs are bad. Uh, like what about finding, what about finding a middle point and just being balanced? <laughs> exactly. That's it. And that's yeah. the whole point, right? It's like, so I, but I also think it's, it's ironic because flexible dieting is essentially that middle ground. But I also think some people take flexible dieting to an extreme. To the yeah. point where it's like everyone needs flexible dieting. Yeah, and like if enough. you think about what I said earlier where it's like I start some people off on a rapid fat loss protocol. Not everyone, some people. But when they start that rapid fat loss protocol, I'm like this is strict. Yeah, like this yeah. is not flexible at all. It, we will get to the point. I think flexible dieting is the end goal. Yeah. Right. I think like that's where we want people to get up. But just like – that's like an advanced form of dieting. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's very advanced. So like in the same way, you wouldn't take someone and have them start them off with deficit deadlifts versus chains, chains and bands. Yeah. Like you – maybe that's the end goal. Hmm. But like you can't start them off with the most advanced version. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um. So one of your videos I really enjoyed and it was shared in one of our groups quite a few times was your failure video. Um, was that a recent one, Matt? Yeah, that one was like about, about two months ago, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's been shared quite a few times and I've, I've watched it through and I've, I've really enjoyed it. And a lot of the um, female followers of, of mine and Empowered by Eating, I've really, really liked it. So what off, off topic, so it wasn't on the video, uh, what would be your biggest failure that's kind of helped push you forward in life? If you could say like maybe one or two big things that have made you, like driven you forward. Oh man, my biggest failure. Uh, well, I mean, like I said in that video, in case you haven't watched it, is um, I fail every single day. Like I fail over and over and over and over again. And my essential, like my my motto is fail your way to success. Um, <laughs> I love it. Like that's like I I think that the difference between those who succeed and those who don't has nothing to do with whether or not someone fails. It has everything to do with. When you do fail, inevitably, are you willing to kick your fears in the fucking face and keep on going regardless of how many times you fail? That's what's going to separate the people from those who succeed from those who don't. Um, So, I mean, like, any big failures? I mean, shit. Like, I think, like, mm, here, all right, here, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Um, My whole business has been built on the the platform of helping people like yeah. that is what i do that like from the, and like a lot of business gurus will say don't give away your information for free don't like charge for your time like you have to you can't like g- give all your your stuff away for free people have to pay for it and my i go the complete opposite route i am like give everything you know for free and then people are going to trust you enough to then 
want to be your to like to buy from you because if someone walked up to you on the street and it was like i have the secret to doing x y and z whatever your goal is you'd be like go fuck yourself like i'm not going to pay for that <laughs> exactly but if they if they came up to you and said i have this secret i'm going to give you this tip for free and you can use it as you wish and then you try it and you use it and it works now you're like all right i'm pretty interested like tell me more so like long-winded way of, of going back to the point of my failure is any time my mind has deviated from helping people to making money, my business has taken a hit. And more importantly, not only my business, but my health and my happiness. Yeah. My happiness goes down when my goal is to make money. But when my goal is to help people, not only does my happiness go up, but my business goes up. Yeah, we spoke about this last week on the uh, on the podcast actually, where we talked about internal happiness, and one of them being an ex- an external happiness would be looking for money, and an internal happiness would be giving and helping people. So if you center your life around giving and helping people, you're more likely to be happier in the long term. So you so that's that's kind of what you what you're trying to say, isn't it? Is that you've got to give basically. Yeah, I mean, you have to do what makes you feel good mm. um, and, like, what, what feels right for you, what is authentic for you, what, like, resonates with you in your gut. Yeah. For me, it's helping people. Mm-hmm. I honestly think that it's an intrinsic within humans unless you have, like, uh, like some type of something wrong with you. I, I honestly think that <laughs> – like, no, seriously, like, I don't mean that, like, in a mean way. I honestly mean that, like, it's most not, humans it, it have an intrinsic natural. desire to help people, yeah. and they get they get happiness from it. It's sort of like like charity. Yeah. Like whenever you give charity, you feel good about yourself, right? Yeah. And and like, granted, also like this brings up the question: Well, is it selfish to help people because you're only doing it because you feel good? And like, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, I think that it actually is selfish, but the just because it's selfish, loop. does that make it bad? It's like, no, I think most of our, are the things that we do are selfish because even if you're giving charity, if you're doing it just to feel good, then like, oh, who cares? You're giving charity yeah. regardless of whether or not it makes you feel good. But like, I think most people have an inherent desire to help people and like have it, they feel good when they do it. So like you, you will be, you will be happier and yeah, you will be happier. You will get more benefit. You will get greater uh, life, you you will feel better about yourself in your life if you help more people. Yeah, it's very relevant. A lot of people in our Facebook group now have learned kind of what we teach around nutrition and things like that. And they're in there helping other people get through the journey. And that's their own little like snippet of internal happiness by helping somebody else. And it's people talk about it all the time when we do seminars and things like that. They're like, I just love helping other people, you know, learn and learn about this and it's great and it's it's really interesting. Um, on that point, um, going back about failure, is there a point in your life where you failed and you were, you, you, were, you had a lot of fear around failure? So before, like going back like, I don't know, 10 years or something like that, was there a big thing that you ever failed that day but you really feared? Maybe public speaking or maybe a powerlifting event or something like that. Was there something that I like feared into yeah. like that? I, um, mm. Something big. Something big that I feared. Mm. Um, you know what's funny? Like, oh shit! Like, I, I I'm not gonna pretend like I have. I've never been scared before. Of course, I've been scared about stuff. Mm. But I think one of the major reasons I've been able to build my business is because I don't think about it. Like. Mm. And it might be because I'm too ignorant, which is a very, like, legitimate reason. Like, I think I'm too ignorant to think about, like, the negative possibilities. Like, I, I just – I don't think about it. I don't – it's not – it doesn't even come to my mind of, like, the negative stuff that happens. I legit flood my mind with the, well, what if this does happen? Yeah, exactly. Like, what if I do succeed? And, like, I, I never – let myself get in the, well, what if this, what if this, what if this is from a negative mindset. And like, I think that's just how I'm hardwired. And I think I'm really lucky because I know other people are hardwired the other way. Okay. But when I think, I think some people are hardwired to think negatively. And I think that's like a very, um, like evolutionary response where it's like, you think of all the negative responses. So you don't put yourself in harm's way. Um, and I think like, 
I also think, even though it's an evolutionary response, I also think that's the way to make sure you never reach your full potential. I think that's why, like, the people who are the most successful are not normal, right? They're not like the common person. They're not like, okay, like they're doing what everyone else is doing. They're the one who sticks out because they they have that, just like, listen, I'm five foot four inches. Like I'm very short, right? So like I'm genetically not not made to be a professional basketball player. I think genetically I am made to like think on a higher level from like, I'm just not going to think about the negative stuff or like let any of the yeah, fears so. keep me from doing something. I think it's a skill that people can also learn and get better at. So if someone is listening to this right now and they're like, oh my God, like I always think about the negative stuff. I'm constantly thinking about like what could, what the bad thing, that, like if I publish an article and, and someone, like what happens if someone doesn't like it? Like for me, like that never even popped in my mind that someone might not like it. I just think like everyone's going to love it because it's a great article. And like if someone doesn't like it, fuck them. But like what you have to do is you have to think like if you're that person who's constantly thinking negatively, you have to put yourself in the mindset of like, all right, I am aware of who I am and that I'm going to think negatively. And now I'm going to consciously switch my mindset to something positive. Like you have to force yourself out of that negative mindset consciously. Yeah, like on purpose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this, um, this, this failure thing, I mean, we, they're more, more likely to fear of failure. So – it's something that we all get. For example, it, it, we're all scared of something bad happening. We all it, naturally we get it. But when we go back to the original biology of human, like when we first came about, like millions of years ago, of course we were we were fearful of death because an animal might jump out at us at any minute. But then, obviously, in modern life, that translates into fear of just random things that might not happen, like somebody might, you might publish an article like you just said before and somebody might not like it. But so what? It doesn't really matter. Do you know what I mean? And people end up being fearful of the, the translating this fear or this this evolution into the, the evolutionary fear. Um, I've, re I've read a book on it once. So we end up translating that into where we are now in society and being scared of normal things. Like, for example, somebody might have been brought up in a poor, poor environment and then they'll be fear of losing money all the time, which will hold them back from doing great things in life. What, what do you reckon? In terms of like, what do I reckon about what specifically? So for example, this, this, uh, we get mixed up in life with, not us particularly, but people will end up getting mixed up in life with this fear of failure, whereas it's yep. just fear of, it's an old evolutionary fear of an animal jumping out of a bush rather than, public speaking and we end up getting the same thing mixed up evolutionary and getting it and then realistically if someone if you fail at business or you fail at doing public speaking or you fail at i don't know something in business it doesn't really matter it's not a big deal yeah i mean i think like i think it's number one it's very subjective like it's going to depend on the person and their situation like who like me i i think it, it totally depends on the situation of like what it is like for example if it's something like publishing an article mm. and you're concerned about like what someone's going to say, that's more of like a self, like an insecurity issue with yourself that you have to get over where it's like, like what the fuck are you concerned about? Who cares? Like, exactly. Like think about the person who like, like, first of all, number one is I have people who hate my stuff all the time. Like I have regularly get emails and comments from people saying, I don't know what I'm talking about that like my stuff is stupid, that it was like, like all the time. Like that's a very common reality. And how does that but, make like, you feel? When I first start, I, even now, like they still bother me. Like I don't like being told that I suck. I don't like being told that I'm in a lot of times in my, my immediate response is I'm going to prove them wrong. Um, a more recent mindset switch for me that like was totally because of Gary. Uh, Gary was talking about it and, uh, he actually mentioned it in passing, uh, and it was phenomenal. It was a big mindset switch for me. Was um, actually before I even say it. Keep in mind, even though I get I've gotten these since day one, I've never not published because of that. There's never been a time that I haven't put in work because I was concerned of what someone would say. I've never left a piece of content in my drafts folder because I was concerned it was gonna piss someone off or like whatever. I've always published regardless, and like you just have to you just have to do that. 
But the mindset shift that Gary said that was a major thing for me was going from instead of getting angry or getting upset or getting feeling self-conscious or hurt because someone says something mean about you or because they don't agree with what you're saying, you should feel sorry and sad for the person commenting because this person has nothing better to do than to be sitting behind their computer reading your content and then taking time out of their day to insult you. So like, yes. how, what an awful life that must be for them to be having the time to literally, their, their free time is spent putting out bad vibes on someone else. Like you're spending your time with good intentions to help people and they're spending their time because they're so sad and in such a bad place that they have the time to do that. They must not really have a happy life. You should feel bad for them. And when you, when someone leaves a bad comment now, and I run that through my head, which is a conscious, the conscious process, I'm forcing myself to do it because my instinct is to get mad. When I force myself to do that, all of a sudden it doesn't matter anymore. I'm like, whatever. I, like, I feel I'm sorry. And like, I'm sorry you feel that way. Like, if I can do anything to help you, please let me know. Yeah, this is my usual it's, response. It's it's being on purpose again, isn't it? In your own mind and it, using empathy to outweigh the the negative. Exactly. You yeah. have to. You have to. Yeah, I mean, it happens quite often uh, to to myself as well, where I'm thinking the, I'm doing the same thing. I'm like, oh, I wish I could help them, but I just I just really can't because they're not ready or they've been tarnished by something else. That's probably one of the quick fixes like we were talking about before. And eventually they'll come to someone like us who perhaps has got a, a more a, a, a more relaxed, uh, flexible approach, so to speak, rather than the quick fix. But yeah, it's more switching to empathy, isn't it? 100%, man. That's it. Mm. That's the game. So when uh, – obviously believing in yourself is quite important. If I was to say how do you – Obviously, you coach a lot of people. I presume, um, I presume, and you've got quite a full, quite a full book at the moment with you with your coaching. How do you take them on a coaching call, for example, and then how do you switch? Uh, how do you help them feel like more? How how do you help them believe in themselves a bit more on a for for for, a, for example on a coaching call? Um, how do I help them believe in themselves? So actually. There's there's a word for this. If I don't know, like, are you familiar with the word uh, self-efficacy or the term self-efficacy? Yep. So, like, if you if you look in the research, like, self for anyone listening who doesn't know, self-efficacy is an individual's belief in their own ability to succeed at a given task. Yeah. So, it's a fancy way of of essentially what saying is how confident is someone someone is in themselves to succeed. And this term was originally brought up for for things like smoking cessation and alcoholism. How do we get people to quit doing these bad behaviors? And what the researchers found was that people with a high self-efficacy, the people who believed in their ability to quit smoking, the people who believed in their ability to stop drinking, they, they had a high level of belief. They were more likely to succeed, which isn't which isn't the most outrageous thing I've ever heard. And like it goes with weight loss as well and, yeah. and health. The people who believe that they are that they are actually capable of losing weight and, and keeping it off are much more likely to do so. Um, and that's proven itself time and time again with myself and my clients. So what I always do is one of the first things that I do with my clients on a consult call is I'll test their self-efficacy. There, there are a bunch of screening questions that you can use um, to – uh, to sort of like gauge someone's self-efficacy, see how confident they are. You can run through their history and you can ask them various questions. And basically what I'll do is, is I'll gauge their self-efficacy. I'll go through the consult call. Um, by the end of the consult call, my goal is to move them up the ladder. So for like, if the ladder is one to 10, one being, they don't think they can succeed at all under any circumstance, 10 being like a hundred percent, I'm going to do it no matter what. My goal is to move them up that ladder. And that's my goal either to keep them as high as possible or to continue to move them up throughout the time we work together. Um, because as long as they believe in themselves, they're going to do it. Um, and so there are a million ways to to increase self-efficacy. Um, one of them is by showing people other success. So like if let's say, for example, um, I have a client who who their weight spiked, right? Like their weight went up and they don't know why and they're really down on themselves. I can 
take a, a previous client who had tremendous success and show them, hey, so this is my client, Lisa. This exact same thing happened to her. Here is her weight chart that I dra- that I tracked, and here is your weight chart, and you can see it looks very similar. That's Just nice. I like it, that. I like that. Right. So it's basically a way to say, listen, you, like a lot of people hear or think or get so involved in what they're doing that they think they're the only one who's going through it. They think like, oh, my weight went up, or oh, I'll never be able to do this. They think that they're the only one who's struggling. Listen, you're a human being. You are not unique in that. We are. Yeah. We are all. We all have the same physiology. From like, yeah, we have slight differences. We have different genetics. But like, humans are humans. Exactly. And yeah. and we have the same patterns. The same things happen. If your weight is spiking up, odds are other people's weight is spiking up. Um, you should know that like, if it's around your period. By the way, like most of my clients are women. Like, I, like around seventy percent are mm. women between like twenty eight to sixty who just want to look good naked and get strong and feel better. So like. I talk about periods all day. So basically, like <laughs> yeah, exactly. you have to understand, like your weight's gonna spike up around your period. Like, let me show you a client, an example from someone else who's did that. Or like mirroring is one of my favorite ways because it, it lets people know that they are normal and that it is normal, and they just have to keep going. Um, there are other self-talk methods that you can use. There, there are other a variety of ways to increase self-efficacy. But um, like, and again, like sort of going back to the beginning of the discussion is uh, progress will drive it. So them actually seeing results. So my, I think too many coaches focus on one measure, whether it's the scale or they only focus on how they feel or they only focus on how they look. Um, I think there's a million, like, why would you only focus on one measure when you could have five different measures? Um, and I think that what happens is like, what I do is I focus on the scale weight. I focus on their measurements. I focus on their pictures. I focus on their clothing. I focus on what people are saying to them. Like it, like they keep track. If anyone says like, Oh my God, you look like you lost weight. Like I keep track of all these things because let's say like your scale, your scale weight doesn't go down. And let's say like you, you don't feel any different. Um, but you've had three people in the last week say something Odds are something's happening, and if you only focus on one, you're more likely to not get that feedback. So, like, th- I think that's one of the biggest things right there uh, to, is to make sure that you're getting as much data as you can, because not everything is gonna make progress at once. You sort of have to like sort of find what's making progress and use that to keep pushing forward. That's absolutely awesome. Um, that that mirroring, I really like that. Um, Especially doing it where I, I, I do that actually by mistake, um, where I'll take uh, a client that's allowed me to share their data and share it with somebody else, um, and they're like, "Yeah, share my share my data because it's going to help other people." You know, this this takes me to a conversation today where I just finished on a coaching call where it was the same as what you just said. It wasn't just saying the scales weight 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 has moved or your inches have moved. It actually went into a binge eating conversation where. The, the measure of progress happened to be the fact that this person hadn't binged eat for a, binged eaten for a long, long time. And it was like, oh, right, because they actually fell off the bandwagon a little bit last week. And then I was like, yeah, but you've had four months where you've been really flexible, really relaxed, and you've not accidentally fallen off the bandwagon because you've, you've taken a different approach. And it was like, that was just a simple measure that helps look at progress. Um, so it's, 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 it's pretty cool when you, when you look at it in a, in a different way, I guess. Yeah, man, 100%. I totally agree. What I'd like to ask you about that, because I've got a lot of coaches who follow me and a lot of PTs that follow, follow my stuff, is to help them. Do you have a book that you can recommend around that self-efficacy? Yeah, I do, actually. So I, I because I speak about that so much, um, what I ended up doing is I have two different articles on my website. Um, actually I have written about self-efficacy a bunch. So if you search like Syat fitness, self-efficacy, it'll come up, but okay. that's, that's not the most important, uh, thing that I want you to read. Like it is good. It'll, it'll break it down in more personal training terms. So it we, is can, we can link, we can link that below perhaps. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. So I can send you those. Um, but, uh, if you Google search the bet, like the top seven best book for nutrition coaches, yeah. uh, or like the best books for nutrition coaches, my article is going to come up and it's titled the seven best book for nutrition coaches. Um, the one you need to get within that article, first of all, read all of them because they're all phenomenal. But the first, the number one is motivational interviewing. And I think that's the, actually the first book that I, that I listed in that, in that article. Yeah, um, very it's, good book. it's not, it's not a nutrition book. It's not a book on, 
on like nutritional sciences. And I think too many coaches focus too much on like, all right, I need to learn more about carb cycling and intermittent fasting. I need to learn more about gluconeogenesis and the Krebs cycle and blah, blah, blah. And it's <laughs> but like, it doesn't, all right, listen, it doesn't matter. shut the fuck <laughs> up. Like none of that matters if your clients aren't going to stick with it. If exactly. your clients aren't going to like find something that works for them. And motivational interviewing um, is the key to that of behavior change. Um, it's like this, this, it's a, it's a psychological tool, um, and there are many psychological tools that like psychologists and therapists use. It's one of many that works very well in getting people to do the things they, they need to do and that they want to do health-wise. Yeah, and we're definitely going to link that below as well. It's a very good book. What was the other books? Can you remember them? Oh, man. Um, oh. We'll just, shit, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, we'll link that, that article with the seven books in as well. Yeah, yeah. If you link that article, like, and also, like, in, if you're interested, I also have one for strength and conditioning coaches, like the top eight best books for strength and conditioning coaches. Um, it's basically those are my two because I got the question, what books do I read? What books do I read? So I just ended up writing an article <laughs> yeah, on like, I think the, like I, I direct think links to Amazon. Like, it's 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 just it saves a ton of time. Um, and those are literally if you read all the books in the strength and conditioning article and all the books in the nutrition article, you will have all of the information that you need to be a phenomenal coach. Yeah, those are like those, those are my bibles. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of PTs, um, personal trainers, and coaches might just do the training course and feel like they're qualified, which is what the training course does to them. The PT course it makes them feel like they're ready. But then when they start reading these books, they realize that, you know, there's a whole hell of a world of information to learn out there. Um, and that's that's where people should be as a as a PT and a coach is to push themselves to be the best they possibly can be in the industry, you know? hundred um, percent. So like what you've just kind of said there is is interesting about your coaching. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who would who would love to get involved with you and I presume that your books are quite full but what we do is obviously with empowered by eating we've got thousands of people going through the the system there it's a it's a really simple step-by-step -step guide on how to learn first of all level one is is tracking calories and then it goes up to macros and and full flexible diet and later on so we've got loads of people going through there which is coming in at the moment it's a pound trial and then it's 10 pound per month after that you know it takes a few months to learn it there's people coming out at the other end of that now who are fully flexed, flexible diet and, and need the accountability, need the strategies, what you're talking about here. So potentially they can use the links in this video and, and perhaps, uh, sorry, in this uh, podcast and go off and, and speak to you. How would somebody get coaching if they wanted to? Um, basically, all you have to do is like if you go to my website, Syatt Fitness, S Y A T T Fitness dot com. Um, first of all, before you even think about coaching with me, which by the way, it's it's an investment. Like it's not cheap um, because nothing I do is cheap. It is expensive. But coaching, like what I would do is, I have a lot of free information. I have over five hundred free articles on my website. I would I would number one, if you like what I'm saying here, go read my articles, learn more about me, see if you actually like me. Don't like just jump into it like here. Like like I need to earn your trust. So go read my articles. I have a lot of articles on yep. how to lose fat and build muscle and get stronger. And if after that, um, you can go to like the online coaching tab on my website and, and fill in the form and, and I'll, I'll reach out to you within about 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then, and uh, again, like that is a little bit more expensive, but it's also very, very hands-on and we talk literally every day. Uh, for the people who might be a little bit strapped for cash, I have an inner circle, which is like an inner circle monthly um, members area. Where a lot, it's like it's only twenty four ninety nine a month, and you can cancel anytime you want. And I give like monthly workouts three times a week, four times a week, metabolic conditioning work, and nutrition programs. Uh, I do like private videos and webinars for them, and like I give them prizes and stuff. So that's like my like what I'm focusing on right now, building because on, the one on one coaching is very expensive, and it is uh, a little bit more like a. Uh, exclusive if you'll say so I'm, I'm getting as many people into my inner circle as possible a lot of whom end up becoming my one-on-one -on -one clients and they get a discount for it but that's really where like you'll get the most out of me for the least amount of money well that goes back to the original conversation of, of building trust in the, in the first place um, and I think a lot of people in business a lot of PTs forget that and try to jump straight to the, the money you know if money is the least important thing 
Um, this is something that goes back to my mum for the past three years or so has been going, why are you giving all this information out for free? Why are you telling everybody everything? And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, mum, I just, I just, I'm just trying to help people. <laughs> it makes me happy. And I know eventually, you know, enough of them people are going to trust me enough to believe that, okay, so he, he, he sounds like I want to get coached by this guy. And then that's where obviously eventually you develop it and why it takes so long to, to a long stra- long term strategy to be able to actually get people to listen to you. So, yeah, yeah, man. Uh, so that's I, that's awesome. it. That's that's the game, and it's funny because there are so many fitness business gurus who talk about like, don't give away stuff you're free. Like, don't give us stuff away. It's like, like you have to charge what you're worth and all this stuff. And it's like my entire business, like everything that I've done has been built on the platform of helping people and giving stuff away for free. Yeah. Um, and the people who don't give stuff away for free are like, they're constantly looking for new clients and new this and new that. Whereas like, if you're giving stuff away for free, it, it comes to you. Yeah. Actually, w- one of my favorite quotes, um, I actually just posted it on my Instagram, which is, is Syed Fitness. Um, I just posted on my Instagram a couple of days ago is, the goal is not to be successful the goal is to be valuable, valuable because yes. when you're valuable, success attracts itself to you. Yeah. Um, and the way you can be valuable is by helping people and giving away free stuff. Exactly. Because people are then going to, rather than be lost in all of the noise, they're going to search your name to find out something rather than, you know, they're not going to see you in the news feed. They're going to come to you rather than actually searching you. Um, so I want to, um, if it's okay with you, just rattle off a couple of questions that came through social media today. Um, the first, yeah, yeah, the first question, in fact, I'm just going to go really selfish and ask my own question first, which is, um, I've got a lot of business people coming on board now getting coached and things like this. And they always kind of sound like they're too busy. Now the busiest person I see in the world at the moment who I follow every day is Gary V. Does he track calories or macros? Uh, he does not. I do. This, this, <clears throat> um, he, he, do, you, do you track calories for him, you mean? Yes. I, I track the calories for him. Um, so, like, basically, he, he, I'm, the way he, what he calls me is I'm the CEO of his body. Um, <laughs> that's my role. Like, he isn't – it's not his job to be – uh, thinking about this stuff. It's like my job is to think about that for him. Okay. Um, he puts in the effort and he does everything. Um, but like, I'm the one who's keeping track of it because like, that's like, he, I don't think people really understand how busy he is. Um, I, I really don't, I mean, I know I didn't understand it until I came on and started working for him. Um, that guy, his schedule, he legit goes like around the clock. Like it's not like, any any time that you have downtime, any time you're watching TV, any time like you're cooking, any time you're doing anything, he is working. Like any mm-hmm. like, and, and I can say that with the utmost confidence because I'm with him seven days a week. Like any time you're doing something where where you where you might say I don't have time, but then like you're you're taking a break, <laughs> he is working. I promise you. Um, so. Like my job is to take that role away from him so he doesn't have to, and I track his calories and macros for him. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and I, I was, I was, kind of thought that would be the way, um, but I was hoping to find something out for the business people that follow how they can go about tracking their own macros if they're super busy. I try to tend them, tend to send them towards calories and maybe protein and fiber, which makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. So what I do is I own all of my clients, like my online clients, I don't track their calories for them. They do it themselves. Yeah, of course. Um, so. They hit calories, they hit protein. I don't give a fuck about carbs and fats. Yeah. Um, if you hit your calories and you hit your protein, you're good. Mm. And as long as like you're eating fruits and vegetables, your fiber is fine too. Yeah. We put that in there. Uh, like we've got five levels. We put that in level three. And, but we say always drop back to level one if you're struggling, which is just calories and fiber. It's like, yeah. Because most people, that will solve a lot of a lot of problems for them. Um, okay, so next question, do from Thea Holden, does he believe? So this is for this is for Gary. I think does he believe in um, regular training has improved his overall happiness and balance for you as his trainer? Do you see that as as improved? Um, so 
there is an important distinction to make. Gary is very adamant and loves Gary loves when he gets the question in in uh, keynote speeches or whatever, like has fitness improved your ability like to be an entrepreneur or your productivity? Because he everyone who asks that is a personal trainer and they always expect him to say yes. And his answers are resounding. Absolutely not. Um, because in Gary's just being who he is, he is an entrepreneur at heart and there's nothing that could make him more of an entrepreneur. Like he, he would eat shit for like in his words, he would eat shit for years because he's an entrepreneur in order if it, if it meant like doing what he loved. So fitness hasn't made him a better entrepreneur. It hasn't made him more productive or anything in that sense. Um, but in my eyes and what I've seen from him, it has made him happier um, from the perspective of like we've seen tremendous progress with his body and, and how he feels. He was in a lot of pain when I started working with him. He had some hip pain. He had shoulder pain. Um, he wasn't – his physique wasn't where he wanted it to be. And he – literally just texted me the other day. He's like, I'm really happy with the progress we're making. So a hundred percent, he's happier because of it. Um, it just is the distinction between, um, is he a better entrepreneur? No, like, and he's very clear about that. But in my eyes, not in his words, but in my words, I, I a hundred percent think he is happier and healthier because of it. Excellent. That's what I wanted to. That's what I wanted to ask or or, or say it actually. So the next one was um, very quickly was from John uh, Malone. Um, his question, basically broken down, was if you could give yourself one bit of advice when first starting your business or brand in the in, um, in this industry specific, so health and fitness, what would that be? Um, one piece of advice when you're first starting. So let's say back to when you first started. I, so, all right. So here's the deal. When I first started, and by the way, this is not sexy. This is not fun. Most people hate this answer. Um, when I first started, my goal was not to make money. My goal, literally I started when I was 19 in terms of writing content and putting content out there. My goal was, and I'm not kidding. People think like, oh yeah, your goal isn't to make money. When I started online training, wasn't a thing. Like it wasn't like, oh yeah, you're going to make like a uh, well into the six figures, a million dollars or whatever, like online training. It like, that wasn't a real thing. I did not expect to make money. I didn't know. In fact, I very firmly believe that if I got into this now, after seeing how successful you can be and how much money you can make, I don't think I would, I would succeed because like my goal would have been money driven. Mm. Whereas then my goal was to help people. And it still is. And I'm very firmly, I will never deviate from that because I know how powerful that, that actual thought process is. So before we even talk about what my advice is for specifically what to do, number one, if you are getting into online coaching because solely because you want to make more money or, and or because you think it will be an easy way to make extra income, do not even try it because you will fail miserably. Um, you will be unhappy. You will you will not succeed because your goal is purely selfish. And I, let me tell you from like the bottom of my heart, this is not easy at all. I agree. I agree. Great. I agree. Brutal. I agree. Hundred percent. It, it is brutal from the perspective, but like it's, it, I love it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade my job or life for anything in the world. It's the best thing because like it, it's, it's incredible. But. It is not easy, just in the same way that fat loss isn't easy. And in the same way that if you're a personal trainer and you carry around like a relatively low body fat percentage, like it's not easy to eat healthy all the time. It's not easy to go to the gym all the time, but you do it and it's worth it and you wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Same thing with business. Um, so my advice would be to put out a ton of content for free over and over and over again. And by the way, that doesn't mean – like spend 30 minutes writing an article and publish it once a week or even like 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 a lot of people do it like once a month or less. When I my articles on my website are so in depth, are so like like they're complete guides on how to giving away all of my content, all of my information. A, a normal article would be between like 6 to 16 hours of work, not 45 minutes and hit publish. It would usually take me a full week to write of several hours a day. Um, yeah, exactly. So, like, what I would say is, like, 
go on Facebook, go on Instagram, like put out content multiple times a day, every day, put out like, do that's like your infotainment is where like you're doing short, brief pieces of content to help people and build trust and also get a website going and put out at least one very in-depth article every week that gives away all of your information that tells but, people everything that, that they need to know on how to accomplish a given task and do that for three years before you expect any return on investment. Let's add some content context onto that. When did you first start in fitness in terms of giving like this, this type of online coaching or even just in fitness, when did you start? My first personal training job, I was 14 years old. Um, and it was at like a legit gym with two coaches who are still some of my best friends to this day who they were very much involved in the scientific uh, end of the industry, the research based end of the industry. Um, I was lucky. I was incredibly lucky because I didn't have a stupid phase. I did do stupid stuff, but my stupid phase was uh, much earlier on and it was um, much more benign than a lot of other people's who like spend years and years and years doing really stupid stuff. I was really lucky in that I got my first personal training job. I was 14 and I was immediately thrust into the science based end of the industry. Um, and, and from that point on, every day, all day, my entire life was – learn, 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 coach, 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 coach until I was 19 when I started my online business. Um, and from 19 to like 21, 22 is when I built my online business. But like, I didn't really start making legit money to the point where I could only work online until I was about like late 21, early 20, no more 22, actually a more mid 22. Um, which if you like 19, 20, 21, mid 20, that's like three and a half years into every day yeah. for like nonstop, like how, three how and a half you, years. How old are you now? 25 now, turning 26 in May. 26, yeah, cool. Um, that question he said was is for both of us, so I'll just keep mine quite brief because I can get the opportunity to say it on another another podcast. But mine was um, my advice to me, back to me, would be ve very similar to what you said there. All of that, plus I accidentally found myself in every business that I've been in because I'm, I'm 33 now. Uh, I started business when I was in the, in my teens. Um, not necessarily always in fitness, but it's always been accidentally passion driven. So going back to translate that to kind of a bit of advice somehow would be to make sure everything you do around business, because it's hard, because it's hard as shit and stats show us 99% of businesses fail. Mine would be to make sure a hundred percent, whatever it is you're doing in business is a hundred percent passion driven and it's something that you absolutely love inside out and you can do all day every day and not get tired of it because it is a long journey like for me this is this this has been a 16 year journey in fitness but a but a four year five year business and i'm only just being heard now like you've just said so that would be me would be go back and say to myself just make sure you stay along this passion driven thing and look for that <clears throat> so that would be my answer to it I love it, man. I love, uh, it's funny. It's like a lot of people like they do things because of money. Like I know a lot yeah. of people like I'm going to start a t-shirt business or I'm going to start like whatever business because they yeah. think it's oh, I'm going to the easy way to make money and they always fail when it's not driven by passion and helping people. Yeah. Exactly that. Um, another quick question was from Nancy Fletcher, apart from asking whether you were single, she also... <laughs> She also um, said, "How do we get rid of these? I'm trying to like trying to make it into a sentence. How do we get rid of fad diets? Basically, how do we delete these fad diets from the world? This question could be an entire podcast. But uh, how do you feel that we can eventually teach people how to not follow fad diets or quick fix well, quick fixes that we should translate it to? We the thing is, um, we won't." Um, there will always be fitness marketers who have bad intentions. Um, there will always be um, these other products that are like coming out to take people's money. We won't ever get rid of it. We will never delete them. They will always be there. I, what, here's what I think. Here's what I hate in our industry, especially in the science-based world, are coaches who complain that all of these things exist. Oh, my God. Why does this exist? Why do my clients do this? Why are people going for this fix? Blah, blah, blah. Because they don't have the knowledge that you have. And if they did, they wouldn't be paying you to be their coach. Yeah. So number one is instead of complaining 
about them doing this, understand that the only reason you have this knowledge is because you that's your life, that's what you love. And they have knowledge about their life that you would probably pay them for or that you would pay for because you don't know, you haven't invested in it. And I guarantee you're doing just as stupid shit in another industry. Like you're falling, like fitness people falling for the fitness business guru stuff, like where they're like, make six <laughs> figures in six yes. months. It's like, you're doing the same exact stupid shit. So stop complaining, number one. Number two is, complaining doesn't do anything. Just like t saying like, oh man, I can't, like why does this stuff exist? This stuff is terrible. Like I, I tell all my clients all the time, it's like, okay, well you know what? The reason they're finding them is because they're better marketers than you. Because they know how to market to the masses. They know the words to use because they're not trying to sound smart to their colleagues by using anterior pelvic tilt and gluconeogenesis and trying to sound smart and show off what they know. They're speaking on their level, being good marketers and getting it to the masses while you just sit there and complain. Like, congrats, like you're doing nothing. Why don't you learn how to market, how to be a good business person, reach more people? Because the more people you reach, the more people you impact. So stop fucking sitting on your ass and complaining and start actually putting content out. So that's for the PT. The PT should switch to being thankful because if they didn't exist, I'm talking about the evidence-based world here, if they didn't exist, then we wouldn't be within a the position we are where we need to re-educate, so to speak. And then exactly. for Nancy or for anybody else, it would be switching their mindset and making it more powerful in terms of being empathetic empathetic, and using empathy to be like, oh, I'm sorry about that. They're following that fad diet. I wish I could help them, which goes back to what we said earlier on, doesn't it? Yeah, sure. I mean, even more than just feeling bad for them is like, how do you actually combat it is like start putting out content, yeah. like help people, like create content that shows people why instead of like, listen, helping and changing one person's life is, is, the, is a blessing. It's one of the best things in the world. But what if you could do that to a million people? And the only way you're going to do that to a million people is if you put out content. And that's probably the driver of both of us, isn't it? So I have um, just asked, I've, I've just selected a few questions there. Just, there was many more, um, but we'll try and maybe do that another way. Maybe we'll um, do it in a written form or on the page if, we, if we've missed any. Um, so the other question I had for you and the final one was what was four times deadlift what was that number because I know just people who were sitting here listening to the whole thing thinking you didn't ask him <laughs> uh, that was I deadlifted 535 pounds at a body weight of 132 pounds uh, 100, 132 wow yeah I'm a small guy man I'm small <laughs> yeah so 535 what's that in kilogram uh, let me check it's going to be 535 divided by 2.2 .2, so let me see um, five thirty-five divided two, by two forty-three, isn't it? Two forty-three. Yep, that's very good. It's absolutely awesome. That mine was mine was close to that, but I'm a, I'm a quite a lot heavier, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's awesome. I think we should end it there, and I want to thank you again for for coming on board, um, and hope we'll get this shared and help a couple of people by by listening to it. So that we'll, we'll we'll end it there and say thanks for everyone for listening to another Empowered Body and Mind Life and podcast. So thank you very much. Thank you.